Food is integral to history. It defines culture, and it often plays a large role in the prosperity of regions or cities or even entire countries. But much of that history is often taken for granted, and unique dishes are only known locally or their history is forgotten. But food often connects us to wider histories that illuminate the past and connect us to the people that came before us. And such is the case with the salt potatoes of Syracuse, New York. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In June of 2021, a historical marker was unveiled in Syracuse, New York, which called attention to one of the city's unique heritages, salt potatoes. The foundation behind the sign is the Syracuse, New York-based William G. Pomeroy Foundation. The salt potatoes marker is the first of a new marker grant program called Hungry for History, which aims to celebrate stories of local and regional food specialties in the United States. Part of a group of grant programs the Foundation has to fund roadside markers across the country. The Foundation's other major goal is to diversify the Bone Marrow Registry, combining founder Bill Pomroy's love of history with his gratitude for surviving blood cancer thanks to a donor found through the registry. The history of salt potatoes is connected deeply to the history of Syracuse, which sits near Onondaga Lake in central New York State. The region is home to the Onondaga Nation, which in the 17th and 18th century was one of the five members of the Iroquois Confederacy. Their primary settlement served as the capital of the Iroquois League. The first Europeans to visit the area were the French in the 1600s, who established a short-lived mission near the lake. In 1654, a Jesuit missionary first saw the springs, which he found to be a spring of salt water, and indeed we made salt from it, as natural as that which comes from the sea. These springs set at the south end of the Onondaga Lake, which they first called Salt Lake. The springs were used to produce small amounts of salt by the French, and in 1774 several escaped slaves were selling salt to fur trappers. It wasn't until 1788 that the Iroquois ceded 20,000 acres around the lake to New York State on the condition that it shall remain forever for the common benefit of the people of the state of New York and the Onondagas for the purpose of making salt. The springs at the lake fell under the control of the state, an area called the New York State Salt Springs Reservation. The salt springs came from wells that tapped into the Salina Formation, a large formation of salt and shale that contained some 2,800 cubic miles of salt. The springs carried the salt from nearby Tully, New York, north, where it bubbled up near the lake shore. The first commercial effort to produce salt from the springs began in 1788, led by Revolutionary War veterans Asa Danforth and Comfort Tyler. In his first attempt to make salt from the brine, Danforth recorded that he used a 15-gallon kettle and in nine hours had boiled down about 30 pounds of salt. The salt industry in the region grew quickly. By 1791, 8,000 bushels of salt were being produced every year, more than 400,000 pounds. There were, however, some wrinkles. The men producing the salt didn't own the land. The state of New York sought to control the resources as a way of raising revenue, taking over salt production in 1797. The producers leased their right to make salt and had to make at least 10 bushels per year per kettle or pan and pay the state four cents per bushel. The state also charged for storing the salt until sale, set prices, and inspected and certified salt quality. The towns that grew around the lake went through a number of names, including Salt Point, Webster's Landing, South Salina, and in 1817, Corinth. Corinth was rejected by the U.S. Postal Service as there was already a city in New York under that name. So the town chose the name Syracuse, after the originally Greek city Syracuse in Sicily, which had some similarities, such as the Salt Springs. The city was officially incorporated in 1825, and it became a major crossroads as the Erie Canal came through the city. The canal changed things more than a little. Suddenly, it was possible to ship goods from the western parts of the country to the east coast, where it could be used by the growing American cities or even sold at ports out of the country. It also gave Syracuse's salt many new markets, but one of the changes was that many New York farms shifted from growing wheat, which could be shipped now from greater distances, to raising pork, and curing pork required an important ingredient, salt. Transporting salt on the canal became so important and profitable that in 1836, salt producers suggested a minor increase in the tax on bushels of salt that led to $8 million in canal debt being paid off. Workers in Syracuse called the canal the ditch that salt dug. The city boomed, growing from a population of 250 in 1820 to 22,271 by 1850. 
Large reservoirs and pump houses were built as the work became more mechanized. The brine was extremely salinated, and one gallon of it could produce a pound of salt. The earliest production was from natural springs and shallow wells, but the first deep well was dug in 1806, 30 feet into the ground. Hand pumps were used to pump the brine, and at its height, around 30 wells were in active operation. The brine was then pumped by a water wheel in the canal, which ran from May 1st until December 1st. It couldn't run when the canal froze. After that, there were two primary methods of producing the salt. The first method was to boil the brine using salt blocks. The boiling blocks were huge blocks of stone with large kettles set inside. The kettles, which could be as large as 150 gallons, were then heated. The first blocks were built in 1798. In the earliest years, the works burned wood, but as wood became scarce, production turned to more expensive coal. The works could burn hundreds of cords of wood to keep hot and later used 11 to 12 tons of coal per day. Boiling formed salt crystals on the surface, which was then skimmed off by workers. The brine could be boiled off two or three times every 24 hours. The second method is the solar method. It takes much longer, but became more popular thanks to the cost of coal. By the 1820s, the companies turned mostly to this method, where the brine had other solids removed before being left to sit in large three-inch deep wooden trays in the sun. Workers had to rush to cover the wooden trays if there was any sign of rain. Salt came to so define the city that Syracuse was nicknamed the Salt City. Millions of bushels of salt were produced, and until 1900, the bulk of salt used in the United States came from Syracuse alone. As many as 50,000 solar sheds were built in the area, with an evaporating surface of over 12 million square feet. In the late 1800s, the city could produce as much as 3 or 4 million bushels of salt a year. In the 1870s, the city's salt works provided almost 90% of America's salt. Throughout the 1800s, a huge population of working-class Irish immigrated to the United States. Between 1820 and 1860, Irish immigrants made up at least a third of all immigrants to the U.S., and by 1840 constituted nearly half. One of the primary reasons for that immigration was the Great Famine, where a particularly virulent potato blight wiped out potato crops for several years between 1845 and 1849. Two million Irish immigrants came to the U.S. in the 1840s. Many of these immigrants settled in the cities that they landed in, but a, a significant number moved farther west. Largely working class, many Irish immigrants worked on the 363-mile-long Erie Canal, along with German stonemasons. Between 1817 and 1825, Irish workers provided the bulk of the labor. While it's unclear exactly what proportion of the workforce was Irish, contemporary reports suggest that much of it was. In 1823, residents complained of thousands of Irish in Albany, while another contemporary reported many wild Irish working upon the canal. Completed in 1825, the canal's construction left large populations of Irish to settle along its route, including in cities like Syracuse, where Irish workers became the foundation of the growing salt industry. The story surrounding the invention of salt potatoes is that during the 1800s, these workers would bring bags of generally small, substandard, unpeeled potatoes to work and boil them in the brine vats in the salt blocks. Boiling the potatoes in salt produces a unique foodstuff. Due to a higher boiling temperature, a salt crust forms along the potato skin, trapping in moisture and giving the potatoes a creamier texture than boiling them without salt. These potatoes at one point made up a significant portion of a salt city worker's diet. If they started as cheap meals for salt workers, the food soon spread beyond the, to the general public. The earliest record of them outside of the salt works comes from an 1883 menu from the Keefe Brothers Saloon. The brothers were themselves sons of a salt manufacturer. Salt potatoes became popular food at taverns and bars, where they were served with melted butter. They grew in popularity after they became a side served at Hinner Waddles Grove, a restaurant that began doing clam bakes in 1914. Hinner Waddles served salt potatoes and clam bakes for more than 100 years before it closed in 2014. The city has been proud of its potatoes for at least that long. An 1899 article in the Syracuse Sunday Herald praised the Keefe Brothers as the only bohemian resort that is distinctly a product of Syracuse. The salt potatoes of Syracuse rank with the baked beans of Boston, the terrapin of Baltimore, the scrapple of Philadelphia, and the frankfurters of Milwaukee. The article goes on to relate the story that the Keefe Brothers grocery opened a bar room which sold only salt potatoes and beer. A Syracusean who entertains a stranger without giving him a chance at this delicious delicacy is lacking in some of the fine points of hospitality, it adds. For the Salt City, time as a salt-centric boom town wasn't meant to last. After 1900, competition from salt sources in the West ate into Syracuse manufacturers' profits. 
1908, the state of New York had sold off its pipelines, reservoirs, and pumps, and the Salt Springs superintendent position ended in 1914. The salinity in the Syracuse Springs was declining, increasing the cost and effort to produce salt. By 1920, the city that had produced nearly all of the country's salt in the 1800s was mostly selling its salt to pack fish, de-ice the railroad, and make ceramics. In 1922, a windstorm destroyed much of the salt yard, and in 1926, the last salt workers drew their final batch of brine. The area deteriorated, uh, largely abandoned, until the 1930s, when then-Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt turned the land owned by the state over to the county. The area was later turned into a park, and the Salt Museum was opened in 1933, built around a boiling block chimney to remember that Syracuse was a city built on salt. Salt potatoes were, and still are, generally preferred in spring and early summer when new and small and not quite fully grown potatoes can be picked and boiled, and it's considered important that you use white potatoes and not the red ones. Hinderwalds also started selling five-pound bags of potatoes along with a 12-ounce package of salt at local markets that were marketed as Hinderwalds' famous original salt potatoes in 1981, and those can still be purchased today. Salt potatoes are still popular in central New York, where they're often served at county fairs and at clam bakes, but they are little known outside the region. The William G. Pomeroy Foundation's Hungry for History program recognizes a number of other local historical foods as well, and is continually looking for new applications of historic food to be recognized by roadside markers across the country. The foundation provides grants to 501c3 organizations, nonprofit academic institutions, and local, state, and federal government entities to fund a roadside marker commemorating historical dishes. To qualify for a marker grant, the dish must have at least two ingredients be a prepared, ready to eat dish created before 1970, and to have origins and be historically significant to a particular region. Most importantly, these markers must be proven historically accurate with primary source documentation. For 2022, the second Hungry for History grant round opens Monday, September 12th. The online letter of intent is due Monday, October 10th. More information can be found at the Foundation's website, wgpfoundation.org. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.